Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's crew news conference with members of the Expedition 34 and 35 crew. Joining me are NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn, Russian cosmonaut Roman Romanenko, and Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hatfield. The three will launch to the International Space Station aboard the Soyuz TMA-07M spacecraft on December 5th. Once they've launched, they will join three crew members already on board the International Space Station, joining NASA astronaut Kevin Ford, as well as Russian cosmonauts Evgeny Talrokin and Oleg Novitsky. Their long-duration mission is expected to include, among other things, the arrival of the third SpaceX Dragon spacecraft, as well as the first Orbital Sciences Cygnus cargo craft. And in March, when their three crew, uh, crewmates have departed, Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hatfield will become the first Canadian to serve as the commander for the Expedition 35 crew. I'll now turn it over to opening remarks. Turn it over to you, Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Marshburn, and this will be my second space flight. I'm going to be one of the flight engineers on both the Soyuz that's bringing us up to station and returning us from station, and I'll be a flight engineer on board the space station as well. Just uh, real quick, I was born in North Carolina. I uh, got a physics degree at Davidson College, got graduate degrees in, uh, from the University of Virginia and the Wake Forest School of Medicine. I was an ER doc for a while became, before I became a NASA flight surgeon and then became an astronaut in 2004. I did have a chance to go to the space station in uh, 2009, spent 11 days docked to it. Um, and so for the flight here, I'm going to be uh, hopefully doing some robotic arm operations. I'll be certified to do spacewalks if we need them. But uh, as with most of us, our main focus is going to be conducting a lot of experiments on board and looking very much forward to uh, after two and a half years of training to getting our hands on the experiments and uh, to see what we find out. And next to me is Roman Romanenko. Добрый день, я Роман Романенко, представитель Роскосмоса. Тоже вкратце расскажу о том, что что я прошел. Значит, до этого я летал один раз в космос. Кстати, вместе с Томом провели неплохое время на станции. В 2009 году выполнил свой первый полет в протяжении 188 дней. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Roman Romanenko, and I'm representative of Roscosmos. And I'll try to be short and uh, brief, and I'll take say a few words about myself. I've already been in space. It was back in uh, 2009, actually, together with Tom, who were together on the ISS, and I spent 188 days there. Родился я в России, неподалеку от города Москва. После чего закончил в Звездном городке среднюю школу, поступил в военное училище, где выучился на военного летчика и некоторое время находился в полку, где выполнял работу пилота самолета. До 2007 года я был в ВВС, после чего написал заявление в отряд космонавтов и с 1998 года находился нахожусь в отряде космонавтов. I was born in Russia in the neighborhood of Moscow and uh, I graduated from a school in Zvezny. Then I went to a military school and became a military pilot. I served in a regiment as a pilot until 2008 and 2007. I'm sorry, 1997, when I left the Air Force and uh, became part of the Cosmod Corps. And since 1998, I've been uh, serving on the Cosmod Corps. Uh, женат, имею двух детей, uh, воспитываю их и параллельно готовлюсь к следующему полет, по космическому полету. And I'm married, I have two children, and uh, uh, I'm getting prepared for my next space flight. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Hadfield. I think it's uh, a really interesting time for the three of us to be having a press conference with uh, the history that is personified by uh, by the recent passing of a couple space pioneers of Sally Ride and, and Neil Armstrong, and with Neil Armstrong's memorial uh, this morning, and also the recent events on Space Station, uh, some really critical operations done in the last couple weeks overcoming some big significant hurdles and having the space station uh, with the combination of the electrical repair and the EVAs and the complexities of releasing the Japanese HTV yesterday, uh, demonstrating the, the necessity for continued expertise and, uh, and skill in, in this thing that is spaceflight. 
And uh, for us to be looking forward to our flight today is really helps put that into perspective. Uh, I'm really lucky uh, to be flying with these gentlemen. I'm from Canada, from the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, I was raised on a farm not too far from Toronto in the town of Milton, and uh, two brothers and two sisters joined the Air Force. Uh, I flew uh, CF-18s. I did a training as a test pilot with the U.S. Air Force and flew as an exchange test pilot with the United States Navy. And I've been an astronaut for a little over 20 years. Uh, I've flown in space for 20 days, and I've been in the astronaut program for 20 years to this point. So I'm looking forward to the uh, six months on orbit. My first flight was to help build the Russian space station Mir, and my second flight to do spacewalks and, uh, and to help build the International Space Station. I'm really looking forward to the, the suite of international experiments that are on board. We've been training all around the world, uh, not only to be able to run that laboratory up there, but to be able to do the science that's on board. And we are ready to do whatever we're asked of. So uh, back to you, Nicole. Thank you so much. We're going to start here with questions from the Johnson Space Center. If you could please indicate if you have a question and state your name and affiliation. We'll start on this side with Mark. Sorry, I was wrong with Mark. Uh, Mark Rowe for Aviation News. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Uh, the first one, I, I think, is for uh, Roman Romanenko. I've seen some scheduling that shows possibly the Russian multi-purpose uh, laboratory module might show up in the spring time frame during, uh, during your uh, crew's time on the space station. And I wondered if that's, if you guys are expecting that with, I think, the module and the European uh, robot arm. Вообще у нас не запланировано прилета нового модуля российского. Он будет прилетать позже, в 2014 году. Вот. Но э, некоторые элементы конструкции будут вставляться в процессе э, пристуковки э, тех грузовых кораблей, прогрессов, которые будут нам приходить э, в промежуток, э, в момент нашего полета. Actually, the docking of the new Russian module is not planned until uh, 2014, but certain parts of uh, the structure will arrive on the Russian uh, progress vehicles and uh, will uh, use them before the new module arrives. Вот, поэтому было бы неплохо, если бы этот э, модуль пристыковался в то время, которое должно было э, расписано раньше. Мы бы тогда имели дополнительные какие-то э, выходы, работы снаружи. Э, это бы было здорово, особенно для меня, потому что я практически всю свою космическую жизнь готовился к этому. И уже второй полет я не имею в плане э, прогулок с другой стороны. Of course, if the schedule uh, held, we probably would have a couple of spacewalks planned. And this was something would be something really good for me because this is something that I've been getting ready for the, my entire uh, space life, uh, getting ready for spacewalks. Uh, but unfortunately, this uh, is not probably going to happen. Uh, thank you. And um, I also had a question for uh, Chris Hatfield. Uh, towards the end of your stay, you'll take command of the space station, and given some of the comments you made as you were introducing you, yourself, what does this sort of mean for Canada in a big picture sense to have um, a representative of their country uh, commanding a spacecraft that's international, and how does that sort of fit into Canada's plans for the future to work internationally or keep pressing ahead with space exploration? Well, let me first answer at a personal level. It is hugely exciting and, uh, and a great uh, honor to be asked to be the commander of the International Space Station just from, from this Canadian kid's point of view. It's, it's just a, uh, a dream come true to be, to be at this stage of my life after all the training I've had to be given the privilege of being asked to do that. So that's a personal answer. Uh, on behalf of the, the country and the Canadian Space Agency, this month marks the 50th anniversary of Canada having our first satellite in space. We were the third nation on Earth to have a, an indigenous or a Canada-built satellite in orbit after the United States and the Soviet Union. And so you can almost draw a historic line from that very first satellite, Alouette 1, right through to the communication satellites, the remote sensing satellites, all of the 
reasons that we have gone to space, through to Mark Garneau's first flight on the shuttle back in the early 80s, and the increased experience we've gained right along the way, right through to uh, Julie Payette being the, the main mission specialist or flight engineer on the, on the shuttle, uh, Bob Thirsk, six months on station. It almost forms, if you were to plot it on a graph, some sort of straight line of increased experience and responsibility. And even though it's very hard to predict the future, I think Canada has done uh, an admirable job of participating and where we can leading in the World Space Program, managed now through the Canadian Space Agency. And I see this opportunity to work internationally, to, uh, to help out with the best of my abilities as a continuation of that. And when, when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon back in 69, I was so inspired by this new human capability. And even though the doors were all closed, I thought someday maybe those doors will open and, and, a, and a little Canadian kid might have a chance to do that. And, and so I see what we're doing now as just a long hallway of doors that are continuing to open uh, to help both uh, perhaps inspire and motivate to young Canadian kids and young kids all around the world in those same footsteps that Neil and Buzz put up there uh, in 69. Tom, given your extensive medical background, I would feel really good being on the space station and having you there. I mean, tell me how your medical background would translate on the space station, what that skill set brings to a long duration mission. Um, when I worked as a flight surgeon on the Mir, uh, for the Mir space station, I wasn't on board uh, it, but I supported the U.S. astronauts that were up there. I was extremely curious to experience what they were experiencing, to better understand human physiology, you, uh, just to feel it on the inside there. But um, the, so I'm looking forward to getting back up there again to experience what it's like to be a human being for a long duration. Of, you undergo changes, not just when you get there, but for weeks and weeks and a month later. So adding to uh, medical knowledge to the extent that I can for be able to come back as a physician, talking to physicians who take care of astronauts um, and saying, this is, this is what, uh, we know by the science, and this is what it feels like, and this is the symptom complex of being in space. I'm looking forward to that. Um, one thing that's, you know, NASA's worked very hard on bringing uh, the trauma center, bringing really good medicine, uh, the top-notch medicine, to a remote location on the space station. Uh, and we can do that with somewhat with technology. We can do it with uh, putting experienced people up there. Uh, but uh, we're always looking at ways to getting even better medical judgment up there. And in a small way, I'm, uh, my medical judgment is what's going to add to the, uh, to the medical care on board. So I, I want to be a part of, of getting that on board a spacecraft even more uh, for a couple of reasons, not only to enable um, exploration class missions, uh, which are not going to have the option of uh, deorbiting if a medical problem comes up, probably won't have enough equipment to do surgery, although uh, we're working on that somewhat. Um, but not only that, but those kind of things were directly relatable to healthcare on Earth and um, increasing healthcare, not only to um, outposts and to uh, underserved areas, remote locations around the globe, but one could consider a uh, inner city ER as being a remote location because it could take you eight hours, as we know, to, to get in to see the doctor. So um, all of the um, Earth benefits are, are huge, I feel like, and so I'm very excited about that. Chris, I know you've got an extensive musical background, and I think there are a variety of instruments up there on the space station. Planning anything or taking anything with you, and what kind of music are you going to plan to listen to up there? It turns out all three of us are musicians in our spare time. Uh, uh, most of us guitar based. So, uh, and on board the space station, there's a guitar, a Canadian guitar, uh, <laughs> luckily enough, made in Vancouver. But there's also a keyboard, and most recently, there's a ukulele on the space station. So, uh, you know, our, our job is, is, of course, to work and keep the station healthy and get all the experiments done. But we do have evenings and some time on the weekends. And just as we do on Earth, uh, astronauts have different hobbies and pastimes, and uh, mine is music. And so the opportunity to play the songs that I know up there, to record songs that I've written. I'm working with several musical organizations on Earth, um, working nationally in Canada to uh, record a song along with, with the band, the Bare Naked Ladies, actually. Uh, to, uh, it'll be in schools and choirs and 
high school orchestras and things all this year, a uh, song that we've written together. So um, it's an extension, really, of communication. We can talk in Russian, we can talk in French, we can talk in English, we can talk in music. And it's a really fundamental human uh, form of artistic communication. And it touches people at a different level in a different way. And uh, for me, music is really important on Earth. And I'm really looking forward to uh, the opportunity to float weightless by the huge cupola window, uh, playing and writing and recording music uh, from that amazing new human vantage point. Uh, for, for Chris and for Tom, Earth observations, I know it's, it's a mandate on the space station, but talk to me about what you will be looking for in your Earth observations on your personal list and then what you're looking for scientifically as well. I, you know, I don't want to speak for Chris, but he's a, a traveler and explorer on the Earth as well as me, and I would love to see a lot of those places I've been to uh, from space and many places I haven't been, which for me involves mountain ranges uh, and remote areas both uh, at each pole as far as our orbit will allow. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but um, large uh, climate events that occur, I've heard about uh, crew members being able to observe that, photograph it to bring back um, the view to people on Earth can have a huge impact on how people feel about the Earth, how they feel about processes that are occurring on the Earth, something you can't necessarily get with a, with a satellite, with a pre-planned uh, uh, series of photographs to be executed by a remote satellite. So I'm uh, looking forward to using my brain, my eyes, uh, to see things both under the direction from the ground, but also to uh, see what I can pick out as to what's going on. We have some wonderful satellites that take great Earth images right now, and Google Earth is as good a, a record of that as possible. But the, the chance uh, artistry that looking at the Earth brings, when you're outside on a spacewalk and you look at the Earth, it, it more than, than, um, than just goes into your eyes. It fills your entire mind. It, it, it is just an overwhelming beauty. And once in a while, uh, some aspect of it will be able to capture with a camera, not just the technical side of Earth and the geography of Earth, but the, the, the beauty that comes from seeing Earth through a different vantage point. I'm flying a Japanese experiment that uh, mirrors their Earth-bound um, tradition of looking at the moon as a reflection in liquid uh, through artistry and, and description. And a Japanese artist came up with the idea of looking at the world through reflections in liquid. And I have a payload that will float water droplets and use a high definition video camera, uh, looking at the Earth's horizon through the various uh, windows of the space station to uh, see the Earth as an artistic human place, not, uh, not just looking uh, as a fact or places that have been or places I want to go. And of course, I'm interested in those but the bigger human side of it, of the artistry and beauty of it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, the wealth and the privilege of time during our six months to see the world, uh, for me, what will be in a new way. Okay, any questions here at the newsroom? Okay, with that, I take it back. Go ahead, Mark. Mark, we're up Radiation Week again. I wonder if you might discuss what your, and even the timing of the uh, commercial, U.S. commercial, uh, cargo craft you anticipate during your uh, six months? I know the schedule's changed. I just kind of wonder how it looks now. Actually, Mark, we just came from a meeting uh, with our uh, flight directors just prior to coming over to speak with you. Um, of course, there's a combination of the, uh, the well-proven uh, vehicles that are coming up and then the newer ones. Uh, we have a succession of uh, progresses, and, and of course the Soyuz is rotating. Uh, when we arrive, all of the Russian ports will be full. There'll be two progresses there, as well as a Soyuz. And then uh, not too long after we arrive, uh, you know, we launch December 5th, of course. Uh, there is scheduled to have a Dragon come up, um, about in the order of six weeks after we get there. And, and then a little later in our increment, we're expecting an ATV uh, towards the end, into April. And then the last piece is the, is the absolutely new commercial vehicle coming up, which is uh, Orbital Cygnus. And the date on that, of course, is still in flux. It's very hard to get to space. And uh, they're trying to make sure they do everything right. And we don't know the current date. Um, we're looking to see it towards the end of our, uh, of our six months. We land middle of May, 
uh, sometime. And somewhere in the last uh, quarter of our time, we're expecting to see Cygnus come up as well. And the ATV will be in, in around that same time frame. So that's the, sig the sequence that we're, uh, we're expecting. But uh, it's, it's not an airline. It's, it's a complicated step-by-step uh, -step stage uh, flow. And as a result, we've been trained all the crew members to, uh, to take care of each one of those vehicles, uh, whether they come up or not. Okay, with that, now we will switch to take questions from Canadian media located at the Canadian Space Agency headquarters in St. Hubert, Canada. Geneviève Beauchemin from CTV News. Hi. Uh, hi, Chris Hatfield. I wanted to ask you, uh, when this was announced uh, two years ago, you talked about the uh, challenges of preparing for a mission that would be much longer than the missions you've done in the past. Uh, what was that like for you? The training uh, is a really fascinating process, actually. Uh, you spend so much of it alone because the, the skills that are necessary are skills you have to gather yourself. You have to fully understand how to fix everything, say, uh, inside the Japanese laboratory or the European laboratory. This morning, I had a two-hour class on refreshing all of my knowledge of how to fix the complex computer and cooling and, and thermal control systems in the European laboratory. And, and it's, it's not efficient to send the whole crew to each one of those. So for years in advance of the flight, you are traveling from simulator to simulator and classroom to classroom, learning all of what, what might be viewed in, in an Olympic comparison as the compulsories before you get to any of the freestyle. And now for the last six months or nine months, we've really started to move in lockstep as a crew where it makes more sense now that all of us have the requisite knowledge and proven skills that now we can start functioning both in the, in the station as a crew for emergencies and day-to-day -day ops and maybe even more critically in the Soyuz as a crew of three because that's the most dynamic phase of flight. Things can happen the, the most, uh, the quickest that we really have to be able to react to. And it, it's maybe like building a pyramid, all of those huge area of skills all getting focused more and more with the very apex of our training pyramid being uh, December 5th when we climb into the Soyuz on the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin climbed into his spaceship, and the three of us uh, light the fires underneath and, and leave Earth. Uh, it's, it's a complicated, a demanding, uh, long process, but a necessary process, and uh, one that I think uh, turns out uh, a group of people that are really ready to do what we're asked to do. Mr. Hadfield, this is Max Harold from the Montreal Gazette. I wonder if you could, uh, continuing on, along that, that line, if you could tell us what some of the toughest parts of your training have been, and what are the ri most riskiest scenarios you prepare for, such as, uh, I guess, a fire or even a meteorite hitting the station? The, uh, the toughest parts of the training, I think, I think probably it is keeping it all in your head over all that time. <laughs> You, you go to uh, Cologne, Germany uh, to study on the European part, and of course they very ardently and, and uh, conscientiously teach you everything you need to know. And then a year later you come back for a refresher, and another year later you come back for a refresher, and then the next time you see it you're in orbit. And how do you filter that in your mind? How do you keep track of the really critical items? How do you keep them fresh in your head? You know, I build a one-pager. Okay, when I'm going to think about the Columbus module, I have this one piece of paper and I've tried to list all of the mental reminders so that I can then picture myself back three years ago in the classroom in Cologne, remembering all those things I needed to know. And that's true for the, the Canada Arm 2 and for spacewalking, trying to keep it all in your brain for that length of time so that when the moment comes, uh, you can remember what that instructor told you that day in um, Sevastopol in the Ukraine that makes all the difference between success, failure, or life, or death. And as you mentioned, the, the, the three leading dangers that we have are a, a depressurization, uh, a fire, or a toxic atmosphere caused by some other cause. And we train in, in great uh, detail as well as enough repetition that it becomes sort of automatic. Uh, we train individually to understand it all, and then we train as a crew 
and in our Soyuz sims, we can be sitting there and, and the Soyuz sim actually fills up with smoke. We're wearing our pressure suits and smoke starts pouring out of our instrument panel on the Soyuz in the simulator. And you immediately, of course, have to react, shut off all the power sources, get your mask closed, get on the ship's oxygen. And you, the smoke gets so thick you can't even see the instrument panel in front of you. Really uh, high fidelity uh, simulation so that we end up with all the right responses, learning how to communicate with each other so that we can get rid of the source of the fire, clear the atmosphere out, assess the health of the vehicle, and do the most logical thing that comes next. And if you took just a regular person off the street and gave them the circumstances, it would be just way too much to ask. But after the years of preparation and the chance to prepare for it together, you can then go confidently, uh, almost comfortably, into what could be a pretty hairy situation uh, with the knowledge that, that you've gained over all these years and hopefully are retaining somewhere in your, in your frontal lobes so that uh, we can react appropriately whether things go perfectly or whether things go badly. Mr. Hatfield, uh, it's me again from the Gazette. I was wondering, you were being rather philosophical before. I was wondering if your preparation for your mission gives you a different perspective on issues here on Earth, such as violence in Libya and even separatism in Quebec. You know, when I'm, when I'm looking at the events of history, uh, it's, it's possible to get really excited about the things that have happened in the last 20 minutes or the last week or the last month. Um, but I try and, and not to overreact or to underreact. I try and look at things in the context of the big picture. And that's true for, for political events, for people misbehaving, uh, doing things that people just shouldn't do, um, for uh, natural disasters that happen for the wonderful achievements that happen and for, and for the deaths of some of the great people uh, at a personal and a professional level that, that go by. And I think one of the benefits of uh, the great privilege that we have of leaving the Earth and going around our entire planet in, in uh, about the time it takes to run this press conference is that it does give you uh, a, a different perspective. You see the world as one place. It's almost like looking at your family and you know you have some relatives that, that uh, you know, you're a little embarrassed about or that don't behave properly or that have different ideas in you and it's a big fractious group, but you're all the same family and you need to figure out how to make it all work together. And so many people that, that focus, I mean, we, we don't do everything right on earth by any means, but the opportunity to see it from a slightly removed vantage point physically I think has a real nice effect on our ability to look at it philosophically and with a little more global view. And it, it's a perspective that we do our very best to, to share and to spread, and hopefully with increased capability to fly to space, one that more and more people will internalize through their own eyes. Jean-Pierre Beauchemin, again, just one more question, Chris, about you talked about the memorial for Neil Armstrong this morning. Just tell me about how much he influenced your career choice. Uh, well, I think every one of the astronauts, even the ones born after Neil and Buzz and, and when Mike Collins was orbiting the moon, when they made that historic flight, will tell you uh, that this was a, a watershed moment in exploration and, of course, in, in space exploration. Uh, for me personally, I was nine years old. It was July, so I was at a summer cottage. And that, that day, that July day, I, I was just about to turn 10, becoming aware of the world. And to see uh, something that was not only uh, really hard, but something that was completely optional. We weren't doing this because we were forced to. We weren't doing this because it was a natural progression of what we were doing. We were doing this because we just barely could for the very first time. And it took us right to the limits, uh, brought out the very best of what people could do. I found that hugely motivational. And of course, the fact that it was uh, successful, that, that somehow, despite the Apollo 1 fire, despite the problems they were having uh, trying to do the same thing in the Soviet Union, all of that somehow 
magically, within our arbitrary timeline that President Kennedy had issued of the end of the decade, all managed to come true through great human ingenuity and capability was immensely inspiring, not just in the United States, but for me in, in Southern Ontario and for people all around the world. And that night, uh, I decided, boy, I'm going to grow up and be something. I want to be that. That is a wonderful thing to be part of. And, and we hope that, of course, we're not walking on the moon, but we are still doing something that is very new in the human experience. And as astronauts and cosmonauts, we speak with students uh, across our own countries and around the world, and that same uh, light bulb coming on and the, the new realization that the horizons can be moved back and that you could do something that is new in the human experience using your own ingenuity and creativity for us to be able to subsequently carry on that, that, uh, that mantle of, uh, of inspiration is, is something that really motivates us because it so hugely motivated me as a nine-year-old kid. All right, with that, we will return here to the Johnson Space Center for any final follow-up questions. And seeing none, that will wrap up our briefing. Thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, to find out more about this crew and the International Space Station, please visit our website, www.nasa.gov station. Thank you.